It's amazing. You know, last week we put application to our prayer. We learned that God wants us to use the authority that God has given us. We learned that God wants us to use the power and authority that God has given us. Remember the process. We pray and get a breakthrough, and then we use the authority that God has given us in the breakthrough, and we take that authority given in that breakthrough, and we begin to use it in that circumstance. It's an awesome, awesome picture. Today, we're going to be talking about kingdom privileges and the spirit of the Antichrist. Kingdom privileges in the spirit of the Antichrist. And I love this. Can I tell you that there are privileges that come with being a child of God? There are privileges that come with the anointing. There are privileges that come because we are obedient to Christ. There are privileges. There are privileges. Now, there is a demonic spirit that works to cripple the church. Now, the spirit's power was identified by John, and he said that the spirit of the Antichrist goes around, that there are many spirits of the Antichrist coming, and it, it lets us know some things. Spirit of the Antichrist lets us know, you know, Antichrist. The word Christ means anointed one. You know, it's not Joseph and Mary and Jesus Christ. Christ wasn't their last name. Christ was a title. It was anointed, the Savior, anointed one, Messiah. So Antichrist would be anti-anointing, the anti-anointing. Now, we talked about and already covered how Jesus chose by his own authority and his own power to lay aside some of his godly attributes to walk this earth as man. Remember that? And then we also talked about how Jesus as the Son of God, even though that he was the Son of God, fully God, he became fully man, and that he walked this earth because he chose to lay aside some of those godly attributes that he needed to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember that? He needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit was his anointing to carry out his ministry so that he could live the supernatural lifestyle so that he could reveal the Father, reveal the kingdom, and show us as our perfect example how to walk this life victoriously. That's awesome. It's awesome. How to walk this life victoriously. But when you think about it, when you think about how this world places the emphasis on the name Jesus or how even the Bible places the name Jesus, you would think any kind of spirit that would want to like diminish the work of Jesus would want to be like anti-Jesus, not anti-Christ. Wouldn't that make more sense? Even, even cults revere the name Jesus. Even some of the cults either claim him as a prophet or they claim him as a good man or they claim him as all the other stuff. So you would think that if something was out there to, you know, even our world says that Jesus was a good man. I mean, people talk about it all the time. You know, Jesus was a good man. So you would think that something that wanted to destroy the name, you know, destroy would be anti-Jesus, not anti-Christ. So it lets us know something here. It lets us know what the spirit is all about. You know what the spirit is all about? It's about this. It is anti-Christ, meaning it's anti the anointing. Why? Because the anointing is what gives you the authority to live your kingdom life. And if the enemy can combat your anointing, he can steal your authority. And if the enemy can conquer your anointing, he can make you live an ordinary life. And you say, what's wrong with an ordinary life? Well, nothing if you want to be ordinary. But I want to live a supernatural life. I want to live a life saturated by the power and presence of Almighty God. 
I don't want to live an ordinary life. I want to walk under the supernatural anointing of the Holy Spirit. There is a spirit from the enemy that his entire job is to try to take the church and get us to live outside of the supernatural. He wants us to live more with our natural mind than with our faith. He wants us not to believe that there is anything supernatural to God and he wants us to live in this intelligible kind of in our own kind of coasting, everything's going to be all right, figure it out, you know, miracles are dead, all that kind of nonsense kind of stuff. He wants to destroy what the anointing wants to build up. You see, the anointing wants to set you free, but he wants to build the walls. He wants to bind you to religious spirits. He wants to bind you to yourself, and the Holy Spirit wants to set you free. I want to look at a couple of these things, and I'm going to walk you through some things today. I'm going to walk you through the entire book of Acts a little later. Because I want you to see your kingdom privileges because people in the book of Acts walk differently, talk differently, and act differently than we act. They walked like they believed what they said. They were given something, and they believed that what they were given had an impact on their life. They believed that the salvation, they believed that the Holy Spirit anointing actually impacted their daily life. They believed that what God was doing inside of them impacted what was outside of them. They believed that you could not have an encounter with God without something changing. They really honestly walked this life and it made an impact. They didn't just play church on Sunday and went back to normal on Monday. Church was who they were. They were Pentecostal in and out. It wasn't a label for them. It was a lifestyle for them. They lived it, walked it, talked it. It changed them. They didn't have to be taught how to live the Pentecostal lifestyle because they were Pentecostal. It breathed in and out of them. It was empowerment. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, it became their life because it oozed in them and it overflowed out of them. And it became something special to them. You see, they, they begin to live and walk and talk and act differently. And I want to show you how they approached it. Because I think we approach it differently. For one, we approach it as someone that hasn't been truly given the keys to it. We approach it as someone that really doesn't have the actual authority of which we say we have. I want to break it completely down for us. I'm going to walk us into it, and then we're going to jump at it. So stay with me here. Let's look at it. For Thomas, I forgot my little clicker, so you don't have to do it. Empowered ministry here. Let's look at the first one here. All right. Look, it was the Holy Spirit empowerment that attracted people to Jesus. It was the way that he walked, the way that he talked. They said that he spoke as one who has authority with a demonstration of power. That the gospel wasn't of words, but of power. It was the anointing in his life that attracted people, but it was that same anointing that drove him and nailed him to the cross. Because it was the same anointing that attracted people to him, was the same anointing that ticked off the religious leaders that had him killed. The empowered anointing that was in his life attracted people and had him crucified. You see, the spirit of the Antichrist is at work today attempting to influence believers to reject everything we don't understand. 
He wants us to reject everything we don't understand. He wants us to reject the supernatural. He wants us to reject everything. It basically boils down to this. We reject anything we can't control. Anything we can't control. You see, that spirit has worked to reduce the gospel to an intellectual message instead of a God encounter. Listen to me very closely. The spirit of the Antichrist wants to remove the anointing. And he wants to make Christ a religious leader instead of an anointed savior. He wants you to know Christ as a religious leader because a religious leader isn't threatening. And a Christian without an anointing can't threaten his dominion. A Christian without any authority cannot chase him out of his home. But when you begin to understand that there is an encounter that you can have with an almighty God, and there is more to this thing than what we can intellectually process, when we understand that God has come to give us authority and power, and we can have an encounter with the master, we will also understand that there is greater is he that is in us than he that's within this world. And we will begin to take back what the enemy has stolen from us. He wants you to reject what God wants to build. Why? Because he wants you to live intellectually and he wants you to forget supernaturally. He wants faith to be misplaced by reason. He wants you to reason through it instead of surrender in it. He wants you to reason through it instead of surrender in it. Being led by the Holy Spirit is an ongoing encounter with God and with the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, you are constantly being refilled and constantly having communion with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing connection. It has to be. The Holy Spirit wants to have communion in your life on a daily basis. He wants to lead you and guide you through things that you can't even fathom. You see, the life of a Pentecostal believer, Jesus didn't die to make you safe. He died to make you dangerous. He wants to lead you somewhere. He wants to guide you somewhere. He doesn't want you to roll over and die. He wants you to live. We live our lives all the time, just looking for the next way that we can roll over. Jesus didn't die to make you safe. He died to make you dangerous. He died to make you take out the enemy. He died to give you the authority and the power to overcome and conquer. You have the victory. You have the power. It's an empowered ministry. But the enemy wants to reason through it he wants to anti your christ he wants to take away your anointing he wants you to do intellectually think through it so that you lose your anointing so you begin to process instead of surrender so you begin to think about all the things instead of letting god handle all the things You see, faith is misplaced by reason. Religion idolizes concepts and avoids personal experience. And I believe that. Look, God wants to have a personal encounter with you. It's anything. Look, he wants to take away your dependence on the Holy Spirit on a daily basis and have you depend on yourself. How can you rationalize and rationally think through it? He works and works and works and works to get the church to not view Christ as the supernatural healing and touching and moving Messiah. He's the perfect lamb of God the, that died on a cross. He's the religious figure that we worship on Sunday, but he has no impact on Monday. No. 
That is a religious spirit from the pit of hell that wants to remove the anointing out of your life. Because if he can make Jesus the religious figure, he can take away your dominion. Because if he can remove your anointing, he can remove your power. And if he removes your power, guess whose power he has? If he takes away your power, he has his power. Let's move on. Kingdom reason. Kingdom reason. Look, following the Holy Spirit is very similar to Israel following the the cloud and the pillar. The cloud of the fire of the Lord's presence that was in the wilderness. I love that story. We just read about it not long ago in our Bible study. It was awesome. You know, the Israelites had no control over him. Where he led, the people followed. Wherever he went, the supernatural activities abounded. It was great. When they left the the cloud, they left what superseded. They left what held them up. And they left the supernatural. But you know what was more impressive or what was more important was the emphasis that they placed on the presence of God. And church, listen to me. The enemy goes out of his way to get us to not focus on being in God's presence. He will do everything within his power to not let you know the severity and the reasons that you must spend time in the presence of God. You see, if they left the cloud, they left what sustained them. The real issues was the priority placed on his presence. When that was intact, the supernatural things abounded. You can say it like this. In the New Testament terms, it was like this. People were focused on his presence means that they were willing to live beyond reason. Beyond reason. Now listen to me. That was not impulsively or foolishly. It was not a... a, impossible or it wasn't a foolish living beyond any kind of just out there what it was was is obedience to God when you're obedience to God or when you're obedient to God that's beyond reason because sometimes God asks you to do things that don't make any sense but when you're obedient to God that opens the doors to the supernatural because obedience is faith And faith pleases God. If you want God to begin to move in your life, you begin to live without reason, which means you begin to live in obedience. And you begin to do things that other people would not do. You look at it all through scripture. What happened? You know, Noah, go build a boat. Well, it hasn't even rained yet. That's a little bit obedience beyond reason. You know, Peter, hey, Peter, go walk on water. Well, that's a little bit of obedience beyond reason. But if you ever want to walk into the anointing and begin to walk on some water, you better get on some obedience beyond reason. But the Antichrist spirit wants to take away your anointing and get you to intellectually think through it that you forget about the anointing that God wants to give you the authority so that you can walk on water. That you can overcome. That you have the ability and power to see it through. It's not impulsive or foolish or a poor imitation of real faith. But it's obedience. It's obedience. You see, it's obedience. But then number three, it, it makes us uncomfortable. It makes, because, you know... It's difficult for some to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit because we have sometimes such limited experience with him. Most of us, we know the Holy Spirit as the one who convicts and the one that comforts. But sometimes we don't really know him. We don't really know his voice. We don't really know what he wants to do. And we, we know a couple of, accept, you know, acceptable, you know, 
manifestations, you know, if the Holy Spirit shows up and the right song is being played, you know, sometimes tears comes to our eyes, we feel a little peace and that kind of thing. And that's great and that's awesome. But you know what really has always bothered me is, you know, back in the New Testament, the Jews would get together every day. And they would come to the temple. And you know what the number one prayer of the Jews were in the temple every day? They would come together every day. And in unified voice, they would pray for the Messiah to come. And at the same time the Jews were in the temple praying for the Messiah to come, Jesus was standing in the outer courts. And they missed him. Why? Because he didn't come the way that they thought he would come. They didn't come the way that he came last time. He came differently. He did things a little bit different or a little bit strange. And I sometimes wonder, you know, when the Holy Spirit shows up, sometimes he doesn't always come the way that we perceive that he should. Or, or he comes a little bit different than last time. Or, or, he, or he moves upon us a little bit different or a little bit. And I wonder sometimes if he's on the outer courts, we're praying for a revival and the Holy Spirit's already here, but we're missing it. Is the Holy Spirit already in the outer courts while the church is gathering, praying for all the stuff that we think we need when God has already provided it? We're just not using the authority to walk in and access it. You know, all this stuff God has already provided for us. He's already given us access. He's already claimed it. He's already overcome the enemy. He's already said and given us promises. And he's already on the outer courts. But the church keeps getting together on the inner courts saying, Messiah, come, Messiah, come, Messiah, come. And all the while we're yelling, crucify him. As the Messiah stands on the outer courts. But the church is all in good esteem. Send revival. Send this. Send that. We need it. 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 Because Jesus is on the out courts. And he comes instead of in a thunder. He comes with whispering words. Or gentle hands. I, I sometimes wonder... The authority that God has given us. You know, the, the goal of the Antichrist spirit is for the church to embrace Jesus apart from the anointing. Why? Because without the anointing, he becomes a safe religious figure who is not a challenge or does not offend anyone. He doesn't offend. He doesn't challenge. He doesn't change anything he doesn't change life isn't this if we were honest a lot of what our world is trying to pump the church to be today you can have Jesus as your perfect religious figure but don't let him have any anointing to change the world You can have Jesus as a good old, good old boy. But don't let him change or touch or affect anything. And that's the way that we have, that's the way sometimes even our family, does. You, you can go to church on Sunday, but don't let it affect your party Saturday. We can have it all these different ways. Jesus becomes the good old religious figure without becoming the anointing to actually change anything. The bond breaker, the one that sets us free. Why? Because the name Christ actually means the smeared one, the anointed, the Messiah, the one that changes, the one that shakes the chains, the one that actually sets you free, the one that breaks the chains that bound, the one that heals, the one that changes, the one that makes us free. In the spirit of the Antichrist, he wants to, oh, wait a minute, you can have that, but you cannot access the anointing that will actually set you free. 
You can't access that power. You can't access. I, I want to I show you something here. Because 2 Timothy 3.5 says something like that. He says, it's having a form of godliness, but denying its power. It's having a form of godliness, but it's denying its power. You see, they, those in the Old Testament lived differently. Those in the New Testament lived differently. I, I want to show you that. I want to walk you through the book of Acts and kingdom privileges. Let's go to the next one. You know, it's having a form of godliness, but it's denying its power. It's having a form of godliness, but denying its power. It's what you have when you don't understand your kingdom privileges. You see, with the anointing comes privileges. The apostles pray differently. They acted differently. They lived differently than we do. People in the book of Acts acted differently, lived differently, spoke differently. Listen, when they were given privileges and ownership of certain things, they used it. They used it. When a person in the book of Acts was given the keys, was given the authority, was given the anointing to something, they actually used it. They used it. Clint, I've been eyeing your black truck out there. It is super, super nice. I have to make a trip to Safford. Would you mind if I borrowed it? Okay, can I have your keys? Okay, can I have your keys? Okay, this is the keys to your truck. Okay, now you are the owner of that truck. So you're giving me permission to use your truck, and these are the keys, correct? So that key will start the truck. Is that correct? Okay, so I have Clint's permission to use his truck. I have Clint's permission. I even have his keys, right? Now, when I get to Safford in Clint's truck, if someone comes up to me and says, man, where did you buy that truck? Will I forget that it's Clint's truck? <laughs> no. I will know it's Clint's truck. Also, if... When I get to Safford for what I'm going for, if they do not have it in Safford and I have to like go to Phoenix, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to call Clint and say, Clint, they did not have what I was looking for in Safford. I need to go to Phoenix. Would you mind if I carried on, right? And know what we would do. But that's what I would do because it's Clint's truck. And I know it's Clint's truck. Knowing it's Clint's truck means that there are certain things that I cannot do. I can't sell the truck. Darn. I can't give it away. There's, there's a lot of things I can't do. But since Clint has given me the permission... And ownership of his keys, there are certain things that I can do. Okay? And I would not even hesitate, nor would I feel like I would have to ask Clint's permission. Let me give you an example. When I opened Clint's door, got into the car or his truck, the first thing I would do, I would not feel like I would have to ask Clint's permission to move his seat to drive his truck. Would you agree with that? Because he gave me the keys and the permission. I would have access to move his seat. That came with his keys. Right? That, that came with the keys. I would also feel like, since it's going to be hot tomorrow, that I probably would have permission to turn on the air. That came with the authority that Clint has given me with my keys. Right? Also, the route that I take to Safford, that would be within my realm of 
authority with the keys that I've been given. Would you agree? I would not have to call Clint and say, Clint, I have the keys. Which way should I go? Right? No. Clint gave me permission to drive his car. Clint gave me the keys. With the keys comes privileges, and I own those privileges. Does that remove the fact that it's Clint's truck? No. But I still, as one that holds the keys, have certain privileges and ownership rights that come with those keys. Now, how foolish would I? Clint says, I can take his car to Safford in the morning. He gave me the keys. So in the morning, I get up, I take my cell phone, I call Clint in the morning. He picks up the phone. Hello, Clint, I'm at your car. I'm putting the key in. May I turn it now? Thank you. Can I open the door now? Thank you. May I get in the seat now? Thank you. Can I put my seatbelt on a Clint? Thank you. Can I put the key in the condition now, Clint? Thank you. Can I turn it now, Clint? Oh, thank you. Can I put the car in reverse now, Clint? Thank you. Clint, there's a stop sign coming. What shall I do? That would be absolutely ignorant, wouldn't it? That would be ignorant. That's the way a lot of us approach the keys that God has given us through our prayer. I want to show you how they did it through the book of Acts. And I'm going to look at this. And you're going to see things that you've not seen before. We're going to walk through the whole book. I want you to stay with me here. We're going to start out with Mark 16. Because this is your keys. Mark 16. This is asking Clint for his keys. This is God giving you the keys. Mark 16, verse number 15. Here we go. You there? All right, come on. You there? All right, here we go. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and they will drink anything deadly. It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Okay, so what do I have? These signs will follow those that believe. After the Holy Spirit comes on them, after they are anointed, they have signs. They have signs. You with me so far? They have signs when the Holy Spirit comes on them. Come on, this is participatory. You with me? All right, so remember two weeks ago we talked about God expects you to use what he gives you. You with me? Okay, so keep that in mind. Here we go. Keep running shoes on. Acts 3, Acts 3. Turn there real fast, Acts 3. I think we have all these uh, Thomases. Okay, Acts 3, verse number 6. Here we go. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And he took him by the hand and lifted him. And immediately his feet and ankle bones were strengthened. All right, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus. 
What I do have, I give you. What did he have? The anointing, Mark 16. What did he do? He said, in the name of Jesus, get up. What did he do? He commanded him to rise. All right, Acts 9, 17. Here we go. 9, 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. So the Lord sent me that you may receive your sight. Now that's not a very good example. That's the worst one. Now let's keep going. Acts 9.33, here we go. There he found a certain man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Arise, make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So the man's been bedridden for eight years. Peter looks at him and says, Jesus Christ heals you. Make your bed and rise. So he spoke as one who has authority and he rose. Acts 9.39 then Peter arose and went with him. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments with Dorcas, which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them out and knelt down and prayed. Now watch this. He knelt down and prayed. Didn't pray for her, but he knelt down and prayed by himself. He got himself ready first. Why? Because we get ourselves ready as we talked about. We get the breakthrough. Now look what happened. He prayed for by himself. He got his breakthrough and then he turns. What happens? Here he, he looks, okay? He knelt down and prayed. Then, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. So Peter knelt down and prayed for Tabitha. Prayed, not for Tabitha, but he prayed. He prayed for himself for a moment, then turning to the body, then he lifted her up. Acts 13, here we go again. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, now look at this, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the anointing, look intently at him and said, O oh, full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him. And he went around seeking someone to lead him. So Paul pronounces blindness on this sorcerer. Then the verse 9 goes out of its way to say, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the anointing. So Paul even pronounces blindness on the evil. And it happens. Why? Because Mark 16, he's already been given authority over it. Acts 14, verse number 8. And in Lystria, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a crippled man from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. So Paul took, looks at him and says, stand up straight on your feet. That's it. He owned it. Acts 16. 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl. Now watch this. I love this. This is really telling here. Acts 16. 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought was who brought her master such profit by fortune telling this girl followed paul and us and cried out saying these men are the servants of the most high god who, who proclaims uh, the way of salvation and this she did for many days but paul now watch this but paul greatly annoyed 
But Paul, greatly annoyed, but Paul, greatly annoyed, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Okay, listen, a couple things here. I said, I said I'd show you some cool things. Listen to this. A lot of people ask, what did the slave girl do wrong? First of all, first of all, listen, you, you, never want, you never want the devil's subversive testimony about you. That's number one. But number two, the scripture tells you very clearly, this is what she did wrong. She annoyed Paul. What an, something annoyed Paul that Paul had already been given authority over, so he used it. That's what it said. Paul was given authority over it. It annoyed Paul. Paul had authority over it, so he used it. Come on. Isn't that what it said? She went around saying all the, all the right things, but look, it says it greatly annoyed Paul. So Paul, Mark 16, he had authority over it. That annoys me. I have authority over it. I'm not putting it up with it anymore. I command you. And now what it said? It didn't say, it said, I command you in what? The name of Jesus. Why? He owned it. Divine privileges. Is anybody with me somewhere here? We're walking through the whole book of Acts. Are you, are you seeing this? They're, they're not praying the way we pray. It's no wishy-washy here. They own what they've been given. They use the keys. They don't walk up to the car and say, Clint, can I turn it now? Come on. Clint, is it all right? I'm coming to a stop sign. That's the way we have prayer service. We work ourselves up into a frenzy. We forget that Christ has given us the keys to be used. Still Clint struck. Still the Holy Spirit. You're not God. You don't use God. You don't manipulate God. You use it in the realms of the authority of God, in the realms of Scripture. Clarify. You can't sell Clint's truck. If you're going somewhere else than where you told Clint, you tell him. At any moment, Clint could say, bring the truck back. Clint owns the truck. Still Clint's keys. But there are privileges when he gives you the authority to use them. Come on. All right, let's keep going. I love that one. Paul says, hey, I got authority over this thing and it's annoying me. So I'm not going to deal with it no more. All right, Acts 20. Here we go. Acts 20, verse number 9. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eucharist who was sinking into a deep sleep. See, even Paul preached boring. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story. Wow. And was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, embraced him, said, do not trouble yourself. His life is back in him, and went back to preaching. Yeah, I think he owned the keys. You know what we would have done? Jesus, 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 Jesus. Call the elders, call the band, call the priest, come on, you know. We'd have a rain dance. Paul just went down and said, he looks dead. Get up. That was the difference between somebody that knew that they had the keys to someone just trying to figure it out. It'd be different if this was just one scripture, but this is the whole book of Acts. Let's keep going. Acts 28, verse number 3. Hopefully you got your turn in. Are we all turning here? We want to stay in the Bible, right? That is the authority. All right, here we go. 
Acts 28, verse number three. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But he shook it off. He shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up suddenly, fall down dead. But after they had looked for a while, for a long time, and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said, he must be a god. So this is kind of odd. Uh, he was dealing with some sticks. A snake comes up and bites him. He's like, not to worry about it. Shakes it off into a thing. You say, why would he do that? Well, uh, let's see. He was given something in Mark 16. Let's see. Let's go back to this. And they will take up serpents and they will be bit. Uh, there was some keys there. Mark 16. So here's somebody that had his keys in his pocket and he was doing some sticks. He got bit by the snake and he's like, huh, keys. And he went on his way. If he would have been like most of us, he would have begun to panic. He might have died. Because fear would have negated his faith, and he would have needed Peter to come pray for him. No, honestly, think about it. If he would have been like one of us, he would have been in serious trouble. I'll never forget a story. One of the senior pastors that, actually our second senior pastor was Centenary Assembly of God, and the pastor right before us became a missionary to Africa. And he came back to do a missions uh, story or uh, mission service for us. And I'll never forget one of the stories that he told. And I've, I've told this for years now because I love it. He tells the story about one of his first trips to Africa in the bush. And basically, it was one of those African tribes where, you know, they don't wear much clothes. And it was men only kind of thing. And. You know, you had to, everything was chief driven and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he had permission to speak with the chief and the chief had some of his leading tribe men around the table inside this tent. And basically it's, you go into the tent and interrupt the chief, it's off with your head kind of thing. These guys were vicious and mean and, you know, don't like mama kind of deal. All of a sudden his little boy, they, they had a, a night crusade the night before and this chief gets saved, but just because you get saved the night before doesn't mean all the things are wiped off the next day. You know, it takes a minute. So all of a sudden they're in this meeting the next day and, you know, the chief has invited some other chiefs and, um, you know, they're sitting around and they're having this conversation. And all of a sudden this little boy, about six years old, runs in and whispers something to the chief, his dad, and, and the dad sends him out. Well, they carry on with their meeting, and then as soon as the meeting is over, the other chiefs are very upset because this six-year-old boy comes in and interrupts, and, you know, it's like off with his head kind of deal. You know, you don't do that. You know, punish him severely kind of thing. Well, come to find out what happened was is this little boy actually got bit by one of the most poisonous snakes in Africa. Well, it just so happened that his dad got saved the night before and took God at his word. So he ran in, told his dad, I got bit by, I can't remember what snake. His dad said, and you're healed in Jesus' name, sent it back out. He went to pray and guess what he was? He was healed instantly. That was the end of it. You see, his, his dad didn't know enough to be had no faith. You know, he didn't know enough not to have any faith. You know, sometimes we know too much to have any faith. His dad got saved the night before in the jungles. All he knows is black and white. This guy says Jesus is everything. So healed and sends him out. He was. I come to wonder, I've told this story a couple of times and I've always asked this question. I, I wonder if my children would have died. 
almost venture a guess they might have. Think about it. If they would not have died, I would have probably broken a leg getting out to find an ambulance. 9 whatever it is over here. <laughs> 2 one, three, six, five, you know, whatever. Call somebody. Because that's how we think. This in his mind, simple, kill everybody, jungle chief, get saved the night before, crude in his ways, sitting in a loincloth, knows nothing, but was told that this Jesus could do something, and he just knows what he felt. Lays his hand on his son, no one even knows it was so quick. And guess what? He owned it. Mark 16. Somebody better be getting free in this house. Acts 28, verse number 8. Here we go. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him. Now watch again. After prayer. This was a bad sickness. So what does Paul do? He goes in and has prayer. Not with the man with himself he gets himself ready to see him and after prayer places his hand on him and healed him when this had happened the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured they honored us in many ways and when they were ready to sell they furnished us with many supplies as needed. After prayer, he places his hand on him. He got himself ready first. But the cool thing was, is he prayed until he owned it. And then he exercised it. Do you see the difference? That's this. That's your kingdom authority. That's what we talked about last week. Your kingdom faith. Through your kingdom prayer. This is the last leg on this journey. Next week we're putting it all together and we're done. But I hope you've noticed how this all falls together. We're building here. Your kingdom prayer with the application of your kingdom faith, where you pray to get the breakthrough, and that gives you the authority, then you exercise it into what is going on. That is where we are today in your kingdom privileges. Why? Because you got Clint's keys. And you got to know you got Clint's keys. See, he's got keys to mama's heart, and he knows how to use it. That's a smart boy. There ain't no doubt in his mind. When she hears him, she coming. <laughs> this will start Clint's truck. I will not have to call him and say, I know you gave me permission to drive your truck. I know you gave me permission to go to Safford. I know you gave me permission, but is it okay that I start your truck now? By the time I was done with that phone call, he would say, give me my truck back. <laughs> or I'll go pick it up for you. Or I'm going to beat you. <laughs> However, he would say. But isn't that what we do to God? Jesus says, Mark 16, all authority, he, he t gives us all this power and all authority, and he, he induces us, not makes us God, but as his children, he gives us certain privileges to exercise. And we walk up to the car with the keys. Oh, if it be 
Hey, your will. Um, uh, uh, oh, and uh, all these other things, and throw some wall in and do this. And we beat around the bush 27 times, and then we come around here, and then we end up over there, and then, you know. We miss the point that when something is subject to you, and this point is made all through Scripture, what does the leader say to Jesus? He says, you don't have to come to my house because that sickness is subject to you. All it needs is your word. I'm a man under authority, and anything under the authority has to obey the superior. And when the superior speaks, the inferior one must obey. You remember that story? It happens numerous times. The, the story, or, or it's the subject is proved out, where, where it has shown us where... The one that is superior or the one that is inferior must submit. Because the one that has the keys or the one that has been given the authority at that moment, he just says, speak the word and it has to obey you, Jesus. And Jesus says, wow, that's awesome faith. But you guess what? You are right. Guess what? It was done at that very moment. And guess what? It was done. Jesus didn't say, well, hey, wait a minute, let me go check on it and see if that was right. Or, or let me, let me, you know, hey, wait a minute. He, he, he just said, we have to come to that place where we understand, oh, wait a minute, we're not elevating ourselves now. Wait a minute, we're not elevating ourselves. We are not God. We're not little gods. We're not commanding anything. We're not commanding God to do anything. He's God. We're not. You don't command God. I'm talking about using just the keys that God has given you. That's it. That's it. Don't step outside of that. It's still God's keys. You can't do anything outside of Jesus. It's still Jesus doing the healing. You heal no one. You have no authority to heal anybody in yourself. You are not the healer. You will no one to be healed. You heal no one. But the deal is, is when I put Clint's keys in the truck and I turn them, my hand is the one that turns the keys that he gave me because I have the authority to turn them. Because he gave me the keys. You with me. I have access to every right that comes with the one that holds these keys at this moment. Because he gave me the authority and the keys, so I have the privileges to use them. Why aren't we? Why aren't we? A lot of times we don't recognize the keys, we don't understand the power, and we approach it wrongly. Instead of coming as one and says, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. You are the superior one. We almost treat it as if the enemy is the superior one. Like by some magical work of ourselves that we have to, that we, you know, they did it Paul walked up and said hmm looks like your foot's broken straighten that was it but to do that he had to fully know that these were in his pocket he believed he was convinced he owned them there was no doubt and it wasn't just Paul, it was Peter, it was all of them. They all did it. We walked through the whole book of Acts. Why? They knew Mark 16.
Because if we don't, it, it goes back to, you know what it said? You can have a form of godliness, but deny the power then in. Or the other part of it, what does James say? James says, look, you can ask, but if your mind or your heart tosses back and forth, you might as well hang it up because it's not going to happen. Because if you say, I, I got the keys, but if I spend all my time speaking and acting like they don't exist, I can't be really shocked when the car don't start. I need some light bulbs to go off. Come on. If we walk around acting like this doesn't exist, or if you don't have the authority to use this, or if you keep calling Clint every five minutes asking him what to do with them, James said, hang it up and it's not going to turn. That puts us back. back to the antichrist spirit see he really wanted me to have the truck where he wants us to deny the anointing and think through it logically because he doesn't want you to be free he wants you to be bound But God has come that you may have life and life more abundantly. He said, all authority and all power has been given unto me. And Mark 16 said, and these signs shall follow those that believe. My question for you today, ending with this, and then I'm going to tell you, let's come to these altars and let's do some business. Is anyone in here? All. Let's define the word all. Tell me now, what does all mean? That believe. Is anyone in the house believe? These signs shall follow. What does follow mean? Go after. Come behind. Should be there when you are. All right, so come on, Bible scholars, let's put this together. And these signs shall follow those, those that believe. All right, are you a those and do you believe? Let's see some signs. Take your sword and use it. All right, come on, these altars are open. Let's make some miracles.